For three decades, Dr. Eric Nessler of Mount Sinai has been on a mission to study the human brain, specifically the neurobiology of drug addiction and depression, in hopes of finding effective treatments. Both are among the top 10 causes of disease burden worldwide. Uh, drug addiction by itself, uh, it's estimated costs the United States about half a trillion dollars a year in lost productivity, medical expenses, and so on. So we really need to do better. Um, I think there's always hope, uh, but honestly, it's been much more difficult to crack drug addiction and depression, to understand what is at the heart of these syndromes, and to develop definitive treatments. I think that difficulty reflects the unique complexity of the brain. The brain is just a lot more complicated than we ever thought and then our ability to use that information to develop better therapeutics. Why did you decide to study depression and addiction? Are they related? We in the field at large uh, discovered that at the core of addiction lies abnormalities in what we call brain reward. Reward is when a person feels good and through evolution one can imagine that an individual's response to rewarding stimuli, food, sex, social interaction, and so on, is an extremely powerful series of stimuli that shape every aspect of a person's behavior. Drugs of abuse cause addiction by essentially corrupting or commandeering that reward system, uh, so that in the extreme, a drug addict doesn't care about any natural rewards. All they care about is getting the drug of abuse. About 10 years ago, maybe about 15 years ago, um, we uh, hypothesized that depression is also due to an abnormality in brain reward. Why do we study addiction and depression together is because we view them both as being caused by abnormalities in brain reward with pathologies induced by drugs of abuse or stress in some of the same brain regions. So are all the people who are addicted depressed or are all the depressed people addicted? Probably about 50%. About half of people who are addicted to drugs also get depressed, and a much smaller percentage of people who are depressed uh, get addicted. So people who are uh, drug addicted, the addiction itself can, can uh, drive an increased vulnerability to depression. And on the other hand, uh, a person who is depressed might seek a drug of abuse in order to make, help make themselves feel better. If um, you are addicted or depressed, does the brain look alike or does it have the same issues or is addiction um, a different problem in the brain than depression? Addiction and depression are caused by partly similar changes in the brain. They're not identical by any means, but there are some core changes that occur in the depressed brain and in the addicted brain that are in common. So that there could be ways, essentially ways to boost Re natural reward that we think would be therapeutic for both syndromes. Is this genetic? I mean, does someone just wake up and not able to be as happy as normal people? Is it a genetic problem that affects their brain? Addiction and depression are both about 50% genetic. Now that's uh, an incredible statistic because it means that about half of the risk for both syndromes is heredity. They're very complex genetic risks. So it's, it's not the case of a single gene causing a person's genetic risk for depression or genetic risk for addiction. It's possible that in a given individual there's 500 genes that come together to create that risk. And therefore it's been extremely difficult to identify those risk genes. Has anyone identified some of them? Hundreds? Fifty? Thirty? In the case of drug addiction, it's been possible to identify a small handful of what will, ex will be expected to be in total perhaps a thousand. So we really are just beginning to break that code. In depression, it hasn't even been possible to identify a single risk gene as yet, even though we know they're there, because depression is you know, roughly half genetic. So if someone has those genes, do they, does environment or stress trigger them or? That's right, so if, if the syndrome is 50% genetic, it means the other 50% is non-genetic. And the question is, what is that non-genetic risk? Uh, it's presumably a lot of uh, environmental factors, stress, uh, adverse life events, 
uh, that increase the risk for both syndromes. And one of the interests in my lab is to understand how it is that environmental experiences like stress or, or other uh, stimuli will alter that genetic risk to determine whether an individual actually gets sick or not.